Good morning and welcome to Mental Health First Aid. Thanks for joining us here this morning and thanks for taking time out of your schedule to focus on this important issue. Mental Health First Aid is a public education program that teaches individuals like yourselves how to recognize signs and symptoms of mental illness, how to reach out if someone might be experiencing these signs and symptoms, how to de-escalate someone if they're in crisis, how to refer them to professional help if necessary. In this course, we're going to talk about some different uh, topics and some substance of the course, but we're also going to go and do some scenario work and some role playing and some activities. So we're going to try to keep it as active as possible. The first thing I want to say is that we're not going to teach you how to diagnose or treat mental illness any more than we teach you how to diagnose or treat physical illness in a first aid course. It's a first aid course. Have you taken first aid before? Some of you have. In, your, in that course, did you learn how to uh, diagnose hypertension? put in a breathing tube, um, set a compound fracture. No, and in mental health first aid, you won't learn how to diagnose or treat mental illness either, but you will learn how to get someone help if they need it. The course is an eight hour course, and we're gonna start here this morning. The first category that we're going to explore is that of depression and anxiety. Again, these are two separate categories of illness, but oftentimes they overlap. Have any of you ever experienced depression before? Does anyone want to share what, what types of uh, things can cause depression or what experiences have you had? Yes? Loss of a, an animal, a beloved animal. Okay, loss of a pet, loss of a, a loved one, really. A, an intense loss, right, can, can, can cause one to feel depressed. Yes, sir. Loss of a job. Loss of a job, right, can really be a traumatic experience for somebody. And depression, the feeling of depression, is part of the human condition. We've all felt it. We all feel it on occasion. But depression, in the sense that clinicians talk about it, is that it impacts a person's ability to function. Depression, it's like major depressive disorder, lasts for two weeks or more and really impacts a person's ability to function. So we're going to explore what some of these signs and symptoms might look like. So as first aiders, we can say, okay, well, this is what we might be seeing and ideally help someone get help early. Because remember, in mental health first aid, early intervention is the key. The sooner that someone gets help for a mental health problem, the more likely they are to have a positive outcome in the end. I want to talk about some of the signs and symptoms that we might see if someone is experiencing depression. Not so that we can diagnose, remember we don't diagnose, but this just helps us recognize that maybe this person could use some help. Again, we're looking for changes in someone's behavior. Let's look at those. Some of those are fatigue, lack of energy, um, uh, weight loss or gain, headaches. Depression can really increase the risk of a person hurting themselves or killing themselves. And so in mental health first aid, we definitely want to be aware of that and do our assess for risk of suicide or harm. And we'll talk more about that in the next segment. The next category we're going to look at is anxiety. Has anybody here ever experienced anxiety before? Probably everyone, right? A little bit about how common anxiety disorders, they're the most common mental illness. 19.1% of the population in any given year will experience symptoms of severity or duration intense enough to qualify for a diagnosis. Okay, now what I want to do is a scenario. I'm going to invite a volunteer to come forward and practice some of these ways of helping me. I'm going to experience a panic attack or I'm going to, to um, act out one. Okay, do I have a volunteer? Ah, yeah, thank you. Why don't you come on up? Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and put this down so it's out of my way. Thank you. Okay, so let's say we're in an airport, and here's the situation, and I've missed my flight, and I have a real important job interview to get to in Atlanta, and I've been unemployed for a couple of years, and I'm just really upset. And you don't know me, but you see me um, uh, visibly upset at the airport. I want you to do your best, as what we've learned, as ways to try to de-escalate me. Okay? Okay. And... <sighs> Oh my God, I can't believe I missed that flight. I can't believe I don't know what I'm gonna do. I, Sir, I got that, I, what? Sir, what? Are, you, are you okay? I, I, I just, I, I missed my flight and I have this job interview and I've been unemployed for, you know, like 99 weeks and I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Okay. Oh my God. Okay, well, oh. I, well I'm here oh. with you and I'm, and I'm okay. happy to help. Okay. Have you ever experienced uh, something like uh, this Sometimes before? I get these, these, these 
panic attacks, uh, but this had never had anything this bad before. I mean, okay. I don't know, I don't know what to do. I, I just, I can't believe I missed my flight. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Okay, well, when you've had panic attacks other times, uh, is there anything that helps you? Oh, you know, it helps me sometimes to, uh, to uh, um, have a glass of water sometimes or to, to get out of a closed space. Okay, uh. sir, could you get us a glass of water, please? I'll stay with you okay. for now. Thank you, thank you. Okay, and I'll stay with you till, till you feel okay. better. Thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh. So it's I will tell feel. you that this will pass. You'll you'll I feel better. So. You others, will feel better. The others have. Sure, oh, and you. I've experienced the same, and it is very scary, okay. but you will get it's better. Okay. And you. I'll stay with you until okay. um, everything passes, and, and, you. and you'll be safe. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So what did we see that she did that was helpful? Yes, ma'am. She remained calm. Her voice was very calming and soothing. Right, and she remained calm. I was not calm, right? But she didn't rise to my level. She stayed calm. What else did she do that was effective and helpful? Yes. She reassured that she was going to stay with you. She reassured that she was there for me, was going to stay with me, right? If she was unsure about what was happening, what would we have encouraged her to do? Call 911. Call Is there anything that she might have done additionally to what she did if we had played the role play out further? Any other things she might have added? Yes. Helped you sit down and get in a quiet space. Might have had me sit down, right? Get to a quiet space. Um, anything else that she might have done as we, if we played the role play out further? Yes, she ma'am. She said that it was real because she had, had experienced it herself. Okay, so she, she provided a little peer support there. She said, I've experienced these before and I know they're scary. She validated that I was scared. She didn't say, don't be scared. There's nothing to be scared of. She said, it's scary. I can see where you're coming from. And that's powerful, right? The peer support and validating that someone, accepting someone where they are and offering to help them. One of the crises that we might see in someone experiencing depression is suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And as a first aider, the A in algae, assess for risk and suicide or harm, encourages us to definitely do that assessment and find out if that person is at risk. So one of the things I want to do now is explore what are some of the warning signs we might see of suicide. Yes, ma'am. Giving away possessions. They might give away treasured possessions, right? Definitely. Yes, ma'am. And withdrawing from people. Might just withdraw from someone. Remember, that's one of those signs and symptoms of depression that we saw. But again, it could be a sign that we need to ask some more questions. So here are some of the warning signs. Threatening to kill oneself, right? We talked about that. As well as seeking access to means, seeking access to pills, a gun, etc., or some means of, of attempting suicide. Talking or writing about death, dying, or suicide. Feeling hopelessness or worthlessness. Reckless behavior. Reckless behavior, whether it's on a motorcycle or even promiscuous sexual behavior, can be reckless and a warning sign for suicide. In addition, a person may describe feeling trapped with no way out or increasing alcohol or drug use. Again, we're looking for a change in someone's alcohol or drug use. Withdrawal, we talked about that, right? As well as demonstrating rage or anger. Suicidologists tell us to be specific and ask a specific question during our assessment. And the questions to ask are, are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself. Now we're certainly not going to lead with these questions in our discussion with them, but we definitely want to get there at some point during the assessment. It's important for us to do this. It's also important for us to say, are you thinking about killing yourself versus are you thinking about hurting yourself? Other questions that are important to ask are, ask them if they have a plan. Have they decided how you're going to kill yourself? Have you decided when you're going to kill yourself? Have you gathered the things that you need to carry out that plan? And this is information you can also share with dispatch, share with clinicians, share with the police if necessary so that they know the level of risk. As first aiders, what we want to do is get as specific as possible. We want to have that uncomfortable conversation because that uncomfortable conversation might lead to you getting that person help and possibly saving their life.
What we're going to do here today is explore a little bit about what psychosis might look like and then do a role play about what it might be like to experience some of these symptoms. Schizophrenia is very rare. It only shows up in 0.45% of the population. It's very rare. In addition, there's bipolar disorder. Some individuals who experience bipolar disorder may experience symptoms of psychosis. There's a certain type of bipolar disorder in which they may experience those. As well as some people may experience psychotic depression, a depression that is so intense that they experience symptoms of psychosis, um, symptoms of hallucinations or delusions. So can I have some volunteers to participate in this exercise? Nathan, why don't you join us? And Susan and Tremaine, why don't you come on up? Okay, so here's the scene. You're in a coffee shop. You're two old friends from high school. You haven't seen each other in years, and you're catching up. But you are going to be experiencing an auditory hallucination. Susan is going to be the hallucination in your ear, and she's going to be reading from a specific script. And you're going to be experiencing the hallucination, having a conversation, and then at the end we'll talk about what that was like. OK, is that cool? Yeah. All right. And go ahead. Oh, hi, Tremaine. How are hey, you? Hey, Nathan. How have you been? Good, good. I haven't seen you in years. What, what have you been know? up to? Well, um... Do you still live in the area? Why is he looking or? at you? Pretty, pretty close. I mean... Is he looking at um, you? Why don't we get some coffee? You were, we're here and sit yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to catch up. You didn't I, have the you time. You know, I, I, I probably shouldn't because I have a what thing. Are, and, um... What are you doing for you? work these days? Why is he talking to you? I heard so you were off in Hollywood as yeah, Well, right. So... It's a Can little busy. Him? I bet. I um, can't trust anyone. But well, here, for you, you have time to you have time to chat. No, I, I, I really, I really don't. Okay, I probably okay, shouldn't. okay. Let's go ahead and stop right there. Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. So, so very low tech, right? But it was intense, wasn't it? Right. Very, is that fair to say? Very. So, what was it like having a conversation? Let's start with you, Nathan. What was it like having a conversation with someone who was experiencing these hearing voices? Well, I could tell she wasn't entirely focused on the conversation. She just did this simple question. She seemed almost confused and flustered All right. by. All right. Now, what was it like for you, Tremaine, to, to have a conversation with him? It was very difficult, um, especially with Susan in my ear. Um, it, I didn't think it would be that challenging. Yeah. Distracting, right? Very I mean, distracting. I mean, it's like chewing gum and, 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 and walking at the same time, plus <laughs> times 10, right? Right, That's right. That's going to be very difficult. Right. Okay. So, and I mean, the point of this exercise is, is I personally, you know, can't ever imagine what it's like to, to, to hear voices all day long. Imagine the type of heroism it takes for someone to get up in the morning, get dressed, go to work, while still experiencing these symptoms of their illness. And people do hear voices and pick their kids up at daycare, go to work, and live um, lives in recovery. And so our goal here is to kind of explore what this might be like to develop some, some uh, empathy, but also to understand how we might need to repeat ourselves or, or speak in shorter sentences sometimes when someone's experiencing their symptoms. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end. And we hope that you've learned something about how to, to recognize the signs of mental illness, how to provide comfort for someone, how to de-escalate someone if they're in crisis, and how to refer them to services if necessary. But remember, you're not a superhero. You're a mental health first aider. And we only want you to engage if you feel comfortable, but we hope that you have some skills now to help someone. Thank you very much.